Hi, I'm Rowan. Welcome to Yeah Right's August. How is it August already? But also, it's really hot outside. Um, meeting of the Scarlet Quill Society. Um, someday, I am going to actually start one of these and not have been laughing or something immediately before we started recording. But today is not that day, y'all. So um, if you want to laugh with me, it's August. The Christmas tree is still there. This is not going to change. It still hasn't changed. Um, the cats are going to come and go. The dogs are going to come and go. Um, but speaking of hot outside, outside is the unceded lands of the Multnomah, Wasco, Cowlitz, Kathlamet, Clackamas, the bands of Chinook, Tualatin, Kalapuya, and the Malala. And in acknowledgement of the fact that we are on these unceded lands, Yarite donates to the Naya Family Center. Um, and Naya is a family of numerous tribes and voices rooted in sustaining tradition and building cultural wealth. And that is sort of the, obviously like not the most we can do, but also not the least we can do to acknowledge that, that we do owe a debt to the people whose land seas are. And then I'm going to hit my phone and we're going to treat that as another segue. Um, so Last night, speaking of families, um, I was at my sister's house and we've finally reached a, a point where my nibbling doesn't want to just throw me out of the house as soon as they can get rid of me, which is kind of neat, actually. I get to be the cool aunt. I have the Nintendo Switch. Um, so they wanted to do a bedtime book and we did bedtime book. And as we're reading this bedtime book, um, and the nibbling is six now, which is kind of great. Like they they can participate in things meaningfully. Um, I don't know who, how many people have read my posts going back five, six, seven years. Yeah, right. Um, but I'm not, I don't have kids, but I don't hate kids, which is, you know, a juxtaposition that people don't necessarily um, buy into immediately. Um, but I'm, I'm not really into babies. I'm going to be, I'm going to be straight with y'all. Um, Pre-verbal humans uh, don't particularly like me and I don't need them to. Um, like that's not a big ego thing for me. I have friends who like their whole thing is like, Oh, I'm the baby whisperer. I'm like, good for you. Fantastic. You take this baby. Um, I'll take it back when it can talk. Um, <laughs> takes the village, right? Like I'm, I'm, I'm over here in the village. you be over here in the village. We're good. Um, anyway, so we're reading this book about obviously like dragons and wizards. And in the book, there is an evil wizard. And my nibbly said, well, what makes them evil? How are they evil? I don't like that. That's evil is not a nice word. That's, and you know, at six, you don't want to engage with there are very real evils in the world and, and this is what's going on, but they're also like a pretty politically engaged little kid. Um, and so what we settled on was this wizard is making poor choices. They are not making good life choices and they're not making choices that support the people around them, which is, you know, the book is aimed at six to nine year olds. Um, and that's a, an understanding of what's going on. But what that said to me, like, as I'm going home, I'm thinking about this interaction that we've had. And I said, this, this character was so flat. This character was so thoughtlessly built that a six-year-old was like, no, but what? <laughs> um, and so that obviously, I'm thinking about that. I'm thinking about this talk. Um, and I'm thinking about, you know, what, what makes a character and, and what do we want to talk about when we make characters? Um, and I think a lot of people are going to sort of jump in and say, oh, Rowan, you're saying we can't make evil characters. And that's not true at all. 100% you can make evil characters. There are people who want genuinely bad things things that are antisocial, things that are straight up harmful. Um, that's their life goal. I mean, the, you know, the obvious example is Hitler. And I'm not here saying, oh, you have to give all of your bad characters a redemption arc. Some people don't 
need, want, or deserve a redemption art. Some people are not great, um, but they should be understandable. And that's what makes a character whole. A character at the end of the day is an entity in your story that wants some things and doesn't want other things. And that's, that's it. That is the whole of what a character is. Um, and if you can't suss that out, then your character isn't well built. And whether your character is good or bad, they should be well built. So I'm going to ramble at you for an unspecified period of time. And then I am going to drag my writing partner, Christine in, and we're going to talk about some of the practical ways, the stuff that I am about to, I literally just said ramble on. I need an editor. Somebody give me an editor today. I also said earlier in a conversation, it is 100% 50, 50. Of course it is. That's, that's how that works. That's how numbers work, Rowan. Come on. Um, so I'm going to bring her in and we're going to talk about um, keeping your characters in character and what that looks like from a story building perspective and some things that you look at as an editor when you are reading a story and a character is not staying in character. Um, and some suggestions that you can make to the author to get this character behaving the way that they need to behave in order for the story to move forward. Um, conversely, maybe the story doesn't go that direction. Maybe the story doesn't need to go that direction. Maybe the story moves in a different direction because this character and that story are not compatible and maybe you need to separate them. But um, that's Writers never want to hear that. Writers never, ever, ever want to hear that. I'm just going to be real straight with you there. Um, so yeah, we're going to sort of tag team this one, um, which I hope you'll find it fun. So what do I mean when I say a character is an entity in a story that wants something and doesn't want other things? Um, we know what entity is, right? Like it's a person or a personification. Um, the house in Hill House is a character. The house in House of Leaves is a character for these purposes. But also, you know, the alien in Aliens, um, Ripley in Aliens, the cat in Aliens, Jones. Oh my God. Almost forgot the cat's name. Somebody was going to jump down my throat. The cat's name is Jones. Um, they're all characters, right? They all, that's also a character. Um, they all behave in, in certain ways and the ways that characters behave are shaped by the things that they want. So when you put a character in a story, when you, as an editor or a reader are trying to identify the character, there are some things that you need to know about them. And you should be able to identify pretty quickly what the character looks like and what they want. Maybe you can't identify their whole life goals, but you can identify their goal for the interaction that they're having in that scene. Um, whether it's somebody gets into a taxi cab and the driver's main goal is to see, this is where people mess up, I think, because if you get into a taxi cab, the driver's main goal is not to get you where you're going. They don't actually, for the most part, give a crap where you're going. The driver's goal is to make money. The driver's ultimate goal is to pay their rent. But there are some things between the driver and their goal of paying the rent, which is needs money to pay rent, needs to drive cab to make money, needs to take you where you're going to make money driving cab. So you're not their goal. This is. And so that's sort of how characters are going to move through the story, right? They are going to be sort of drawn. There's, there's a string between each character and their ultimate goal. And as an editor, when you spot that character, um, you know, it, it is great there's two ways to approach this, right? It's great if the author wants to give you a list of, of character goals. 
um, like maybe, you know, Snape's goal is to love and avenge Lily, right? Um, or Frodo's goal is, honestly, Frodo's goal is to have an unbothered life at home and he never achieves it. He never, ever, ever at any point achieves it. And it's the, the thing that a lot of people miss in Lord of the Rings is that the only characters with well-defined, well-stated goals never get them. Um, and I think it's, it's a strength of Tolkien's writing is that you can see all of the ways that they're working towards this goal and all of the things that they're accomplishing. It's, they literally save the world in service of being able to have a garden. Um, and it's so cool, right? Like, but you can constantly trace that every action they take is calculated to bring them closer to their goal. Or you have this moment on Mount Doom with Frodo and Sam where they say, well, maybe I can't get that goal, but I'm reevaluating my goal. And my goal is that other people can have this thing that I consider super desirable. Um, so that's another thing that happens to characters, right? They reevaluate their goals. They think about whether their goal is, is worthwhile. They think about whether achieving that goal is genuinely going to make them happy, whether it's a, a positive for the world, whatever sort of drives that character. Um, but they will keep moving towards that. They will keep moving away from things that they have aversions from. But you might not get that in the first encounter, right? So back to we're at the first encounter, we're looking at the character. What do they look like? What do they want? Um, your characters should be adequately described. And I want, I want to say like, there is an art to describing a character and not saying anything about how they look. Um, for example, you could describe me as the kind of character that discovers an unopened bottle of three-year-old mascara. That's the kind of person I, I, you know, whatever. Um, yeah, sorry about my makeup cabinet, you guys. Um, out there walking my dog with his full face on at like 10 in the morning. It's great. Um, which again is a description of a character that does not describe the character physically. The downside of this artful character description is that, especially if you are writing in English, especially if you are writing for an audience that grew up reading, that has been reading, that has encountered in school the vast tomes of cishet male white Western literature, um, whatever you think of the intrinsic value of any individual book in that series, what you are carrying as a writer and as an editor is the weight of hundreds of years of literature where if I don't describe a character, they're white. You can still see it really, really obviously if you go to, um, I can't think of a website off the top of my head, but you can literally just Google character descriptions, casting descriptions, and characters that are supposed to not be white are described specifically and physically characters that are that are most likely to end up being cast white are not they might say wayfish they might say um sullen they might say they have all of these like can the actor hit this emotional range in a way that our audience will recognize things but very, very rarely does that not end in the casting of a white character, as opposed to the other characters that are explicitly described as this is the black best friend, this is the Latine uh, buddy in high school. Um, you know, so if you're carrying the weight of that literature, you have to push, you don't have to, I, I can't make you but it is a net positive when you 
push back on that and make sure that you physically describe all of your characters. And then when you are physically describing, when you are, as an editor, as an editor, what I do when I'm reading through a story is I will write down each character's name as it comes up. And if the character is not named in that interaction, I will write down, you know, woman with cake. Um, and in a lot of instances, um, you know, woman with cake will never appear again and it's fine. You know, we have a description of her. We know what she looks like. She's carrying a cake. She wants to get the cake from point A to point B. Great. That's enough information about that character. She walks through one scene. Um, in other instances, woman with cake is the unnamed spouse of this character who he never thinks of by name through the entire, like, thousands of words of the story. And you're like, why do you think of your wife as woman with cake? You know, why, why do you think of, of your kid as child with ice cream? Wouldn't you think of them as, as like, all oh, of these little Hitesh, right? Like, so like, name the characters. Uh, so they should have a name, right? Like, especially, especially if it's like, when was the last time you thought about one of your parents by their physical description? Or did you think of them as, you know, my parent, or did you think of them as, you know, uh, whatever your, your name for your, I grew up in a hippie family. I called my parents by their first names. I think of my parents by their first names, um, when I'm talking about them, but I, I would never say that woman in the red tank top when I'm talking about my mother. Right. Um, although now I feel sort of compelled to, because, <laughs> um, Hi, mom. Uh, so, you know, so you should find out this information about the characters in, in fairly short order, um, in the same way that you would if you were suddenly in a Zoom meeting with them. Um, if you are tuning in right now and looking at me, you know what I look like, you know what I sound like, you know that I talk with my hands by this point. Um, you know what I do for a living and you know that what I want to do right now is talk about characters. Um, except I'm an introvert. So what I really want is for that clock to run down. No, I kidding, kidding. I love you all. Um, if you can't identify that this character is not fully built and you need to go back to the author. So character descriptions, this is the first place that a lot of authors, get into trouble. Um, this is the first place. Sometimes I say that a story tells you more about the author than the characters. That's very rarely a compliment. Um, when people are described in certain ways, it also carries a weight of history. Um, for example, like last, last month, uh, when we did the sensitivity reader panel, I think we talked about not referring to people of color as food. They're not consumables. They're not made of coffee or chocolate or cocoa. They're definitely not, you know, um, there's also a long and freighted history of referring to white people with high value words. Um, alabaster, sapphire, gold, golden. Um, when you refer to one group of characters with high value words and another group of characters as consumables, you have set up a racist backdrop for your story. I Full stop. Uh, whether or not you ever intended to, whether or not. So as the editor, your job is to spot that, dig it out, give them a better way of going about it. Um, uh, you know, one way to do it is to look at the culture the characters are operating in and the things that they would encounter and figure out how they would think about each other in terms of the everyday objects they see around them. You know, instead of his eyes were as black as coal, say his eyes were as black as space. Um, you know, there's more things around you than food. 
his skin was the color of old paper. Um, what am I, literally, what am I looking at around here? Um, you know, there's, there's rugs, there's wood, there are stones, there are minerals. Um, there are, the, the periodic table of the elements is not going anywhere, y'all. Um, it's out there. That's what the universe is made of. Where, wherever in sci-fi you are writing, those are going to be there for you. Carbon will still be carbon. Um, I really hope nobody digs this up in like 10,000 years and is like, oh, that aged poorly. <laughs> but, you know, the, the stuff that we are discovering is that so farther down, you're, you're much less likely to encounter it because it only exists for like nanoseconds. Um, also, congratulations to the people who just figured out how to do fusion. That's super cool. <laughs> Uh, please don't make new elements. I, I need this talk to last. <laughs> um, so, you know, you do have ways to describe characters. The other thing that you should be looking for in these character descriptions is artifacts of racist caricatures. So a friend and I were talking last night and we talked a lot about fish that people think look funny. And how a lot of that, whether it's the blobfish, which actually is a very attractive fish when it's under pressure. I just want to be very clear about that. It's in its natural environment. It's super cool. Um, blobfish, uh, schnook salmon uh, that have a, they have a big sort of a, an upper jaw hook like this. Um, a lot of the animals that were like, ha ha ha, look at that funny animal. That's actually based in a long history of like both of these examples are based on a long history of anti-Semitic caricatures that we've been told are funny. And we've been told that things that look like that are funny. So don't, don't let things go unexamined just because you're like, oh, well, that's an animal or that's, you know, a goblin. If you build a vast network of bankers with hooked noses who are greedy and, you know, whether or not you are working off of other notes about goblins throughout history, you're still also working with anti-Semitic stereotypes. And I'm, I'm using anti-Semitic stereotypes right now just because it's, it's sort of this low hanging fruit. There are some very, very visible characteristics, but your job as an editor is to familiarize yourself with what the harmful stereotypes are. Um, whether it's the magical Negro stereotype um, where you have a black character that has like mystic knowledge and their job is to guide the hero or the mammy stereotype where the here is a black woman providing nurturing to a white child hero, like find out what those stereotypes are and make sure that the authors that you work with aren't invoking them accidentally. If the authors that you work with are invoking them deliberately, you have a decision to make. Um, and, and that's just, that's the way it is sometimes as an editor. And I can't make your decision for you. Um, I don't know your situation. I don't know how much you need to make rent. So, you know, figure, figure it out. So we've gotten through a sort of, oh, hello, here's a character in the story. Do they exist? Do they have a name? So then we move on to what do they want? Who are their friends? What are their enemies? What do they, what do they hate and fear? And the reason that you need to know all this about your characters is not necessarily because we're trying to humanize the bad characters. It's because if you want your characters to do things, it has to be something that is along the way to their goal. Um, by and large, people do not want bad things because they are bad people for the sake of doing bad and knowing that they are bad. Um, I think a lot of people sort of experiment with that in their teens. Um, like, oh, what, what does it feel like to be bad? Or you're playing video games and you're playing Knights of the Old Republic and you choose the dark side. Um, that is certainly a thing that people do. It's a thing that, that people sort of enjoy that exploring, like, what does it feel like to be bad for bad sake? But ultimately, like out in the real world, even, and again, I just want to put a pin in, I am not over here trying to humanize Hitler. Um, 
or Alex Jones. Um, <laughs> all of these people have reached some kind of psychological accommodation where they see themselves as the hero in their story and they see a virtue in the thing that they have a goal for. Some of them don't even want to think in terms of bad or good. They think in terms of like powerful and powerless. And they're like, oh, well, all of this talk of community and stuff, well, you wouldn't do that if you ever had any actual power. Obviously, like what the powerful do is they take and they're not obligated to anyone. And so that's my goal is I want to take and not be obligated to anyone. And so um, that is an antisocial goal, ultimately. Um, I, it, I would judge a person that I encountered who thought like that, but, um, you know, but they clearly can see themselves as the hero of their own story. So if you have a character who's moving through your story and they're an evil wizard doing bad things because they're bad, a six-year-old can see through you. I'm just like, want to keep coming back to this. The six-year-old knows better than to put this character in the story. Why is this character blowing up the kingdom? because they're bad that that's literally it they're, they're casting a bad spell because they're a bad person and it's going to have a bad result and it's not going to get this character anything it's not going to do anything for this character and so that's something that you have to sort of keep in mind when you're checking to see if woman with cake is a whole character um you know does does she want something and that brings us to sort of the next step in the checklist that we gave everybody in this month's post link to the description like and subscribe oh my god it took me like 20 minutes to get to like and subscribe um are the characters actions in character are they staying in character and this is something that i think christine and i are going to talk about in just a few minutes because sometimes you have a character who you need to convey a character from point A to point B. So you have a character that has this piece of knowledge that your main character needs. And your goal as the author is to put these two characters in the same place and get, give character, I'm going to call them Alex and Horatio. They're Alex and Horatio now. Um, so. Alex knows something that Horatio needs to know. My goal is to put Alex and Horatio in the same room at the same time for long enough that Horatio and Alex talk and Alex tells Horatio the thing. Um, at this point in the story, these two characters don't know each other. They don't have any reason to know each other. Uh, why would they be in the same room? So a lot of authors will just sort of shove them into the room like, oh, and then Horatio went into the room and then Alex went into the room and then the door was locked. And it's like, why would they even go in the room though? Why, why is Horatio in this room? What, what did Horatio hope to accomplish by going into the room? What did Alex hope to accomplish by going into the room? Um, why, why would he go into a room with a stranger? So instead, what you do is Horatio is trying to get from Portland, Oregon to Portland, Maine. He, he's he's cross Portlanding the country, um, and his car breaks down, and so so you're like, okay, well, here's here's a long opportunity. He's got like a week here where he can try to where I can try to get him in in contact with Alex. All right, what if what if I break Horatio's car? Now suddenly he's going to be more likely to be in contact with other people for lengthy periods of time trying to achieve his goal of getting to other Portland. So now I can put him in a room at a car mechanics and I can break Alex's car or I can have Alex pick Horatio up hitchhiking which also puts them in an enclosed space for a period of time where two strangers would be expected to make friends, um, make friends, to, to communicate, to have a conversation. Um, 
so there's there's all sorts of ways and so instead of trying to just shove my characters into a room where neither one of them have a reason to be what i do is i move the goal and i put it on the other side of the place that i need the character to go um so that's that's something um excuse me i i literally like i almost never talk except, <laughs> except on zoom anymore um my throat is so dry right now um characters so as an editor every time a character does something and you're gonna spot it really quickly even if you're just sort of beta reading or giving some top level comments because it's gonna it's gonna light up this little why would they do that light bulb in the back of your brain like why would they do that why would they go into that room why would they have a conversation this doesn't seem like something this character would do right if you if you want to have batman kill a guy you're gonna have to come up with a reason you can't that's not something batman does um it's like his one line right <laughs> um other than i am the knight but you know if you want to have people can spot and you know if you are having trouble spotting it go read some bad fan fiction um there's also f fantastic fan fiction out there um there's there's just some stunning writing but don't read that read the bad stuff find a story where you know just sort of read through them in order and you'll get like 300 words in and you're like captain america would never that's what being out of character looks like and that's that is you having an understanding of who captain america is what he wants and what he will and will not do in service of that goal and so you've just bumped into him either doing something that he has an in canon stated aversion to or something that would be a deal breaker for him moving towards his goal or you found him moving towards a goal that you think is incompatible with what you know about the character so that is what you are looking for when you are trying to figure out if the characters are staying in character and all of this goal moving stuff that i'm talking about is stuff that you can suggest to the author once you've identified the character's goal um and again bad for bad sake is not a goal but i need to kill you know 30 people is a goal it's an evil goal um but it is this character's goal and they're gonna keep moving towards it um so that's that's kind of like the suggestions right like and and again if you can't identify the character's goal go back to the author and say i can't tell what this character wants and so all of their actions are feeling kind of flat because it doesn't seem like they have any motivation to do anything and this is another thing that writers complain to me at least as an editor um about a lot oh i got halfway through my story and my character just has lost all motivation i can't make them do anything they don't want to get off the couch i'm like I don't want to get off the couch, but I'm here. We're having this meeting. I don't want to get off the couch either. Figure out something your character wants more than they want to stay on the couch. Um, that's how you, that's how you motivate a character. Instead of just yanking them around and moving them through your story, draw them through the story, coax them. I, this is like octopus hand. I don't know what I'm doing here. Um, and then the last thing before I jump to my conversation with Christine that I want to talk about um, is patterns in the story. Um, this is a thing that is very much your job as an editor to be the person who spots because the author is not positioned to spot this. Um, and a lot of readers, you know, may or may not notice this. Um, once you do start seeing these patterns you can't unsee them so try to turn that that piece of your brain on right like um 
I'm trying to think of a, a real world example, whether it's like, oh, this actor always gets typecast as this kind of character or, you know, when you're watching a Disney kids movie and they're trying to have diversity, but the same two black kids show up in every single scene so that there's like enough black kids and they're just counting on you not noticing that it's the same two black kids in different clothes. Um, that that actually is a Disney children's movie. I have no idea which one it was because it was playing in like an auto shop or something that I was watching, but it was it was egregious. Um, and people do this in their writing too. Um, they will not on purpose. They will say, "Oh, I want to have about a third Latina characters," and you know, great. So they hit that that checkpoint. But what they haven't considered is that all of those characters are gang members, and all of these characters are not. Um, are all your good characters one color? Are all your bad characters one color? Are they all you know one group? Are they all one social group? Um, how is that social group chosen? Is this a racial group? Is it an affinity group? Um, how are how are we working with that? Um, circling back, character descriptions. Which characters get a good description and which don't? Which characters, is there a group of characters that is described one way and another group of characters that's described another way? Like I was talking about with the high value words and the food words, right? Um, but there's also like some characters are described like all the way down to every detail in their clothes. Other characters are not, which, you know, obviously you're not going to give equal airtime to every character. That would be ridiculous. Um, and now I want to write a story that does that. Um, but if two characters are of roughly the same importance and they're going to have roughly the same airtime in the story, they should have the same amount of information generally available about them. Um, I, I People are going to say, well, what about detective stories? Because like the murderer is blah, blah, blah. The murderer isn't even in the story. For most of the story, um, not as the murderer. So, no, you, you don't have to describe the murderer perfectly all the time in your in your detective story. Um, certainly, that would take away. I, I mean, that could be a huge spoiler. Obviously, um, it's information that your narrative character is probably not going to know. So that's another way to to look at it: is does your narrative character have an appropriate? It's a, especially if you're in a, a really tight third person or a first person, does your narrative character have an appropriate amount of in information about each character based on the interactions they've had with them and, and what they know? Or does your narrative character suddenly know that like somebody's got two kids at home and I'm like, how would they even find that out? How you may know it. And this is another instance where it's good to know more about the characters than goes into the story. Um, both the author and the editor should know more about the characters than makes it onto the page. Um, brief, brief word about nonfiction. People in nonfiction are also characters and you need to put in an appropriate amount of information about them. Um, this doesn't mean that you have to like make up motivations for them or whatever, but you literally, you already know what they look like. In most cases, if you're writing like historical nonfiction, um, you may not know. You may not have a portrait of every person who is in your book that you're you're describing. We we don't know exactly what a Sumerian copper seller looks like, but by God, do we know that that copper was bad? Um, so that's that's the sort of thing that. That, that gets included and doesn't. And you, you still need to think about this when you're writing and editing nonfiction. Is, is my husband enough information about a character or does the reader need to know that your husband is shorter than you? Is that going to be relevant to the story? Um, is this information that the reader needs to understand to understand why you guys are having a fight over the height of a door frame and he doesn't think it's a problem and you do. Um, 
give give them enough information like everybody's goal is to walk through the door it's the door to the bathroom you have to get in there but now you're having this this fight over the best way to achieve that goal so you suddenly have an antagonist and a protagonist because all an antagonist really is is someone who has desires that are incompatible with what the protagonist wants um and that can mean that the antagonist wants to do something genuinely terrible and the protagonist doesn't want that to happen but it can also just mean you want to rent the same chuck e cheese for your birthday party so chuck e cheese is sensory hell please don't take your kids there <laughs> um, i think i think that actually wraps up all of the stuff that i wanted to say and and all of the questions that i usually get about character building so i'm gonna actually um reach over here and I'm going to bring Christine onto the screen. She's over here on me. So if I keep like kind of looking this way, um, hopefully that's, that's going to work out. Hi, Christine. Thank you for joining us from vacation where it like <laughs> looks really nice. <laughs> it is very nice. It's a little hot here in the sun. Um, I miscalculated how long the shade was going to hang out on the back porch. So uh, you always um, make me sit in the sun when we go to a coffee shop. I, everybody's going to say, oh, well, but she's green screen. That's, it's actually the view that she's looking at, guys. <laughs> <laughs> it's better than the, you know, backside of the house, so. Anyway, so characters, um, when you and I write together, um, characters are sort of your job, right? <laughs> well, I like to think so. Um, <laughs> No, I love building characters. It's one of my favorite things. Um, and uh, so much you know, so that sometimes I, you forget to make them do anything. But yeah, there's that. <laughs> Is that fair? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's totally fair. Um, I can talk about their history and their desires an awful lot, but actually goals, that's where I have a little bit of trouble. So it's handy having an editor as your writing partner for this sort of thing. Because when I get stuck, you know the right questions to ask to keep me moving right. forward. And I feel like all I do is I look at the story that you say you want to tell. You're like, oh, well, I want to get this person from this end of the train to this end of the train. Mm -hmm. And that's that's the whole goal of the story is to get to the engine. Um, and, and here are my characters and what they want out of life. And I'm like, okay. And then I just start moving the train around the characters <laughs> instead of... And as long as as you keep the characters behaving like themselves they will get to the front of the train because i keep like breadcrumbing it <laughs> yeah you know and it's i think it's super helpful to have another person to bounce this off of uh, whether it's an editor a friend um you know somebody in the yeah right coffee house um, oh yeah we're not friends say, anymore. <laughs> <laughs> uh, somebody who can who, who can take what you say about your character and and just say well what do they want to do with that like right where are they going what what is what are they thinking about um rather than just you know being a character being a person you know and right that was the thing that we ran into with your first novel right was that you had yeah, this yeah. really well-built character and i hated her she had <laughs> she had Poor no Anna. Yeah, I know. She's she fine. had no real goals. I think her, her main goal was she she wanted to get away from a bad relationship and go to college, basically. Um, which are and, perfectly fine which, goals for a character to have. Right, but those are very far future goals, kind of. So, like, to get from point A to point B. I mean, well, they were a B, week away, though. Yeah, I mean, there's, they're like, there's things that needed to happen in the the middle to make it well to make a story for one thing you know if she just got on this airship and floated away and you know went to call it like there's no story there there's no right right it's it's a diary that's entry, where i was right? stuck. like it's yeah, a series exactly. of events so exactly. we, that's we where put, i got stuck we put four hundred and fifty thousand words of, of world saving <laughs> plot between her and her goal <laughs> But that's, yeah, I mean, that's, so. that's all we did, right? Was that yeah. you had a character who in the ordinary course of events would have gone from point A to point B, left home, gotten on this airship. Uh, trip takes about a week. 
Um, she gets off the airship in about a week and she's in a new city and then she has to, and we could have told that story too, right? Like, we could have told that story because how she was going to actually get into college was a whole nother. Right. Situation. Right. So there, there was stuff to explore there, but what you were interested in was this subplot with like the dashing airship captain and um, the mysteriously burning fire in the city and um, right yeah right so so you know and and the trick was to to take this character and throw them into a situation where she was extremely uncomfortable um, not her you know it did not play to her strengths a lot of the stuff that. Um, you know, so, so, right. You know, you talk about moving the goalposts, like it's not that you move them forward in a linear manner necessarily, but you kind of hook a right over here. I mean, it's sort and, of like uh, put stuff in between her and the goalposts more than moving the yeah. goalpost. Yeah, yeah, that's a good way to put it. Um, so, um, and so each, each new sort of stumbling block created new motivations and new goals like smaller shorter term goals right. and so like the idea is to kind of hit all those goals while keeping the main goal get to college in mind right uh, so how do you you know how do i how do i deal with the fact that my airship has been hijacked right right and, and one then of the circling things that i know back in edits um we came up with some really just genuinely because we knew so much more about the characters at that point um circling back in edits a lot of the stuff that i had actually put in as this is in the way 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 um became kind of extraneous with what we mm -hmm. then knew about the characters so this is another mm -hmm. like great reason to sit down with your friend or in the coffee house and talk about your characters <clears throat> not just about what you think is cool about your characters but like i spent a lot of time in that first major round of edits asking well why wouldn't he just like why mm -hmm. why are they doing all of these you know 12 steps to get from point a to point b why wouldn't they just fly there and right? yeah. then you have to examine, are these steps important to the story? What do we take from each step or keep from each step that's important to the story if we just fly from here? Or do we need to make a reason for them to do these steps? Right. And, and so the other thing, like your editorial brain helped me with was um, these, these things where I was like, oh, it would be really cool if Anna, you know, did this thing and knew all this stuff about this topic. And, and you were very good about reining me in and saying, well, why would she, you know, why would yeah. she know, you know, how an airship works? Why would she know how to fix, you know, the, the wing mechanism? Why would she know right you know, how to sneak and it's around. not that she can't yeah. know right like I don't think I right. ever if you gave me a reason why she would know it I don't think I ever told you well no she can't right you know yeah. for the but... sake of the story because I hate that it, I think it's one of the things that uh is the most frustrating for me when characters go out of character is when they wouldn't have a really simple and obvious piece of knowledge mm -hmm. um, right. yeah exactly like, it's why, the, why, why wouldn't they why would you, I just saw a meme come around about like, oh, if you're, if you're a starship captain and you need a character to do something, what you have to do is say, come to the bridge. I need to talk to you immediately. And then the character has to go all the way from point A to point B. Just tell them on the communicator. They're right there. They're, they're already talking to you. You're already on the phone. You're already on the phone. Um, <laughs> just tell them. Like, because then they're going to have to go all the way back to the transporter room or wherever the heck they were. <laughs> it's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. Um, so there's both like, yeah. why, why would they know this? And why, why wouldn't they? And I think sometimes as a writer, I get so excited about my characters and I want them to do things um, that I, I'm not always thinking about, well, is this the thing that they would do or should do or could do? You know, you know, I, I want, Right. It's really, really cool if your character climbs out onto a flying airship and patches the the envelope. But right. is that something like, that 
in a fully crewed airship is that something that this character would ever do and right? even if yeah. it wasn't fully crewed is this the person they would pick <laughs> right exactly exactly and so kind of making those choices more realistic and logical um not to say that characters can't make illogical choices right but that that because, comes from a place too right it comes from right yeah exactly i, I do stupid crap all the time <laughs> like i i do stuff that makes no sense but also it, it comes from someplace right like right if i am sitting here with a full fridge of food ordering dinner it's because i'm having some kind of a like executive function meltdown or i'm working too late or <laughs> what whatever is going on and for some reason i cannot make myself cook dinner um even though it makes no sense to order dinner when I've just bought groceries, right? Mm -hmm. Objectively. Right. So. So, yeah. Um, sometimes it's... it's I mean, sometimes your characters are just going to like, YOLO! <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> but is your character that kind of character, you know? Anna is not really that kind of character. Right. Um, to, I think she becomes a little bit more that way over learning, the course of Learning the story. to be that person. <laughs> yeah. So that that's kind of an interesting journey, but um, but yeah, having it, when you get really caught up in and if you get really tied to your character and and you really just having another person help you figure out which of these cool things you want to do are are realistic or work for the story and for the character is really helpful because sometimes I just want my character to do all the, all the cool stuff. And really that character is not the right one. You know, somebody right. else should be doing this. And, um, and it's frustrating because you're like, but it's, it, you know, it, it's like a game, like tabletop game uh, mm -hmm. mindset where you're like, you know, you've got your party of characters or whatever, and everybody wants to do the cool thing. Everybody wants to yeah you know defeat the big bad or 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 find this treasure you know which circles back to like every character thinks they're the main character mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. i think that the the more every character can envision themselves as the main character the more realistic your writing is going to be yeah yeah because once you once you start having sidekick characters that are like i'm a sidekick and i am perfectly content only doing sidekick things <laughs> really i mean that can be their personality, but if well, so, like, why are the they out of their comfort thing. zone, <laughs> right? Yeah. Well, side, Sam doesn't want to be a sidekick. That's no. not his goal. But he doesn't really want to be the hero either. No. Most of the time. No, so but... It, 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 so there's something... It, there's, there, there's a but range, But Sam right? is the hero of the Rescue Frodo story. Mm-hmm. Like Sam's, yeah. Sam yeah. sees his job not as saving the world, but as rescuing Frodo, and he is the hero of that story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, so your characters might actually be sort of living in different stories in a way. Yeah. Um, as far as Sam is concerned, yeah. Merry and Pippin are his sidekicks, right? Yeah. In the rescue yeah, Frodo, exactly. Yeah. And as far as Sam's concerned, Boromir's the actual antagonist. It's not even Sauron, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So, like. <laughs> so yeah so, so, yeah, so your characters them. are going to perceive those those actions in different ways and they're going to respond different ways it feels really inauthentic to me when you have a group of characters and an event happens and they all respond in the same way mm -hmm. or or where there's not at least like a little friction if the hero character is doing something that another character is really good at. Right. Exactly. Which isn't to say that you have to like create a perfectly balanced team of let's just call them the Avengers. Yeah. Um, <laughs> where everyone has one particular strength and everybody only does that one particular thing because um, it turns out that that also kind of feels inauthentic that a lot of people in real life have overlapping skill sets and interests. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And that when you create a series of media where everyone is the one who, that's mm -hmm. not actually a good team. It's not because nobody can pick up the slack if something happens to one person. Right. 
right? given the kill count in Marvel movies, something was gonna happen to at least <laughs> one person. <laughs> so, all right, um, we are we are at time, and Christina is at Frozen. <laughs> So I don't know how your, how your internet is holding up there, but, um, I think I, oh, yeah, you're, you're very frozen on my screen. Maybe, maybe it's not frozen in the recording, fingers crossed, but, um, but we'll see how it does. Connection yeah. It seems to be unstable here. It's probably the heat <laughs> outside in the sun. Your poor computer. Um, yeah, it's great timing, though, honestly, if the internet was going to go down. I think we've covered pretty much everything that we set out to cover. Um, obviously, if anyone has questions, if you're in the Society, you can ask in the Society channel. Um, feel free to bring it to the Discord for broader discussions. Uh, I would love to see people in the next couple of weeks talking about their characters. Next month, we are going to do a hard pivot and talk about nonfiction. Um, so I have a special guest coming in who is a nonfiction editor who really doesn't work with fiction at all. Um, she'll take the occasional fiction project on but but primarily edits like academia memoir personal essay um so that is really exciting because it's a completely different uh style of story building and i am really really excited to bring that to everybody and we will see you next month